So we're just having a, a bit of a chat here with uh, Dinny Collins. Um, Dinny's a, a Bitcoiner. He knows a good bit about um, money and fiat money and inflation and stuff like that. So uh, take it away there, Dinny. Give me an introduction and see how we go. <laughs> see, I told you your job was easy. <laughs> you natural. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Dinny, Dinny Collins. Um, a brief introduction to myself, sure, we could spend the whole thing talking about that, but um, had a bad back accident 15 years ago, may, maybe a bit longer, ended up breaking my back, uh, ended up living in a mobile home, had no job, no means of, of making money or earning money for myself, and uh, that was sort of rock bottom, I suppose, uh, on the dole, so didn't even have a job, and um, I suppose the journey from there was just taking responsibility, taking ownership for my body being broke was my fault and it was up to me to help fix it rather than just putting the blame on, well, the surgeons didn't fix me right the first time. Uh, so I sort of took responsibility for my body and I also took responsibility for my finances and I was like, I need to get out of this. I can't be stuck in this. My parents worked like most Irish parents. They worked hard. They worked their asses off all their life, but they never had enough money and, uh, and there was never enough you know, the family never had enough money to do all the nice things that some other families would be doing. And I'd always be, I suppose, jealous as a kid or thinking like, I'm missing out. How come we don't get to do this? So to become wealthy was always something that I wanted when I was a kid. It was sort of instilled in me as I want money so I can look after my parents and they don't ever have to worry about this shit again. And that really motivated me and lit a fire under me. But the journey then, I suppose, from, from rock bottom to go from, I, I call it, it's cliche, but I call it mobile home to mansion. <laughs> That's terrible. But, but the journey was just um, learning how to invest both in my education. That's the biggest return I got on investment was on education and learning. And, uh, and then investing into assets once I understood the system that we're in and investing into business. That was one of my main investments in my early days was to, to build businesses. And... Um, uh, and, and that journey has just taken me through entrepreneurship. After I healed my own back, I created a fitness business. And um, the, the, and then I was like, well, if I can get myself from being feckin' stuck in a bed, not able to walk, so I can get a lad to lose a few pounds, that's easy. So I created a fitness business, again, about maybe 12, I think we're 13 years in business. And, um, and that went from strength to strength. I put a lot of work into it and ultimately sort of retired, sort of was able to get myself in a position to have an option to retire. So I went in sort of partial retirement at 38. I kept getting bored every time I'd done that and I'd end up coming back and working on something else. And in 2020, I started crypto with Dini because I just, I'm really passionate about crypto. Um, that had a good impact on, on my life, on my future, on giving me security for my future and no worries about the future and helping me not be, be destroyed from inflation. And it's also the highest performing asset class. Uh, in the world. So I was like, well, it's been good to me. And just like, I love teaching fitness. Well, crypto is also like fitness is good to me. I'm like, well, crypto has also been really good to me. Maybe I'll just teach people what I've learned over the years and all the work I've done. And again, like teaching fitness, teaching uh, crypto is a pleasure because you're just chatting with like-minded people and you're helping people and people enjoy that and they're happy to, to pay it um, for that. And it's awesome. If you can get a job doing something that you love, well, it's pretty cool. Yeah. That's sort of me, man. <laughs> And like uh, what comes across to me from you is your kind of your energy as well. And you have this kind of energy and kind of presentation and it kind of gives people confidence. And then you have a bit of humor mixed in. So it's kind of an all around kind of a package. And I find it I found it quite good as well. Um, and yeah. you just you mentioned the inflation thing there. And that's just something that I wanted to maybe speak about because like we all see it now, like and it, maybe in the last three or four weeks, it's become even more you know, stronger and heavier on our pockets. Like ordinary everyday people are going out, they're, they're buying their groceries, they're buying cars, they're, they're buying everything they need, but but the prices are just seem to be rising. And sometimes people are, are wondering, why are these prices rising? What's going on? Like, and a lot of us don't have a financial education or know anything about what's going on in the markets and all the stuff in the world. Could you give us a, a kind of a simplified version of what's going on or, or what's, what's, go what's happening? Yeah, inflation sim inflation is, is terrible because it doesn't discriminate. Inflation just destroys wealth across the board to people that don't understand what it is and how to protect themselves from it. Inflation is basically happening. Um, if we go to first principles, inflation happens when we expand the money supply. So what does that mean? Um, I like sort of give an analogy of cigarettes in prison because I think that will help people understand it. Uh, basically, over the last two years since 2020, 
central banks all over the world have printed a lot of money. So they've basically created money out of not, nothing. And money is just a form of, of energy. And the laws of our universe are that energy can't be created or destroyed. It can only change forms. So you can't then go against the laws of the universe and actually create a money out of energy and put it into the system and not think there's going to be consequences. So by printing money, what that does is it devalues the money that I have in my savings. So when a central bank prints euros, it devalues all the euros that I hold in my bank account. Now, how to understand why that happens and sort of the expansion of a money supply is, let's say we're in prison. I've never been there yet. Hopefully I don't go. <laughs> but <laughs> um, let's say you're in prison. There's a thousand lads in prison and they're all smokers. Okay. Thousand lads in prison. They all smoke cigarettes. The typical thing you've seen it in the films. And some lad is able to smuggle in 10 cigarettes a week. Okay. And I'm holding just in my hand here a little marker. So pretend this is a cigarette. There's 10 of these coming in to the prison every week. All right. And we've seen in the films, let's say there's a thousand lads wanting them and there's only 10 a week. So that's a scarce asset and a desirable asset because they're all smokers and they all want it. Okay. So one lad could, if he was able to get one of them 10 cigarettes, or even if he got them all, he would be able to exchange those cigarettes. Those cigarettes effectively turn into a money because anything can be a money. We think of money just as our currencies, but it's not true. Like gold is money. Uh, investment property is money. When you're investing into stock market, you're actually making stocks be your money. Yeah. Um, so the cigarette effectively becomes a money. And then that person, because they're holding the money or the currency, they can choose to exchange it for goods or services. You could be like, all right, well, I'm meant to be washing the toilets all week. I don't want to do that. I'll tell you what I'll do. There's my cigarette, Paddy. I'll give you that cigarette if you do my chores for the week. And because the cigarettes are scarce and desirable, Paddy be like, feckin' right, I want a cigarette. I'll do that. I'll do a week's work for that cigarette. Okay, so now we're going to bring in an expansion of the money supply. So imagine a central bank printing money. Imagine then whoever's smuggling in the cigarettes, instead of getting just 10 cigarettes in, now they're able to smuggle in a thousand. So now the cigarettes aren't as scarce. They're still desirable, but they're not as scarce. So now when I go to, to Johnny or Paddy, I can't remember who I said, and I says, Paddy, right, yeah. Paddy, I'm on my, I'm on my feckin' toilet cleaning duties again this week. I'll give you one cigarette. But now one cigarette's not worth as much anymore because they're not as desirable. There's a thousand cigarettes a week. There was only 10. Yeah. So now that one, Johnny's like, would you go away, Danny? I'll do one day for one cigarette. I'm not doing, I'm not doing seven days. Those days are gone, baby. You need to give me five cigarettes for seven days. So that's an, exactly what we're seeing today is your euros just don't buy you the same amount of stuff. You've got to give more euros to get the same things. And that's because the system has been flooded with euros. That's more in the overall system. And that debases or devalues or steals energy from the actual ones that, that we hold ourselves. So uh, that, that's just sort of my, my, my example of, of, of ba the basics of inflation. Hopefully that uh, makes yeah. sense. Yeah, that, that, that explains it very well. So like, as well as the money in our pockets being worthless, Presumably, the money in in our bank account or in our credit union account or any of these accounts is is starting to diminish as well. Although we don't see the figure going lower, but m must be something uh, happening in there as well. Would that be right, Danny? Yeah, yeah, totally, man. It's and and that's why it's like a silent tax. Inflation is best best described as a silent tax because people don't realise it's happening and it's just stealing their wealth. And your wealth is your time because we exchange our time for money. So when your wealth is stolen, that means someone is taking your time or something is taking your time. And like, for me, my most valuable thing is my time because it's finite. My time and Bitcoin are the only two things on the planet that are finite. You know, I only have what I have. I don't know what I have, but I only have what I have. Um, so in our bank account, let's say you've worked all your life, you've saved up 50 grand. Think of maybe my parents, you know, 70 years ago, 10 grand was the equivalent to 100 grand today. Most people still think like that. And they don't realize that the money's been inflated so much that 100 grand isn't like 100 grand 10 years ago. A million is the same as 10 million. You know, it used to be when I was a kid, if you became a millionaire, you were set for life and you never have to worry. But now you're not set for life as a millionaire. You go and buy a house in Dublin, that's probably 700 grand if you want a garden. Now you have 300 grand, like that ain't gonna last you a lifetime. Um, plus all your property taxes and everything else that goes on, on top of that. And if you have a car and you want to put a bit of petrol in it or you have electricity and you want to turn on the light switches, 
you know so the, the million the money is not worth what it was worth and that's the problem that's why we don't see this happening because it's the purchasing power that's diluted okay it's not like someone's coming into your bank account and and taking if you've 50 grand saved up they're coming in and taking it so you've only 45 grand but effectively that's what's happening because your 50 grand is losing purchasing power and rather than you've been able to buy a certain amount of goods and services now you have to give more of your euros like we're seeing on the petrol pumps now it takes more of our euros to buy the same liter of petrol than it did last year than it did two years ago than it did five years ago and and i i just ex like to explain it in points of guinness because i like me i like points and like when i started drinking guinness it was 190. uh at the weekend there i paid 520 for a guinness and i'm out in rush like so that's not dublin city prices i was like wow that's like one point to get one point now is over a fiver so it's inflation harms all our accounts the problem is that the poor and middle class plebs just like me we don't understand the system and we were always taught in school just get a job and save get a job and save money but the system works against you when you do that if you save money you're punished because inflation destroys your money i i explain it to people it's like okay you're working and you're saving and it, think of it like you have a bucket and you're trying to fill it with water and you're at the tap and when that bucket gets full that's financial freedom you can turn off the tap and not work anymore baby and go and enjoy you know more of the fun things in life okay but the problem is with that system is there's a big hole in the bottom of the bucket so you're working away and putting the water in and inflation is just constantly draining water out of your bucket so you can never reach the end goal it's always moving away from you it's a horizon that you can never get to but it's inflation so by us having money just sitting in our bank uh, inflation has taken the purchasing power from it and it's just a lack of education that normal people haven't been don't understand this wealthy people do that's why wealthy people don't own much cash or they don't save much cash uh, they save in assets like like it's horrifying really because everyone it's affecting knows nothing about it uh, you know they're going doing their everyday tasks they're working hard they're they're saving their money but it's not on the 6-1 news it's not on the news oh the money has been taken from you in your bank account. The money has been taken from you in your hand. You can see the inflation, but we can't see it. You know, it's like something that should be on the news, but it's not. And we need to know about it. And that's why I've took up maybe a bit of courage to just get this out there. And, and I've, I've learned so much from you. I think anyone that's working harder than I work, because I don't count myself working hard, they should know about this too. Um, but you're, you're explaining it well. I don't think we have that much time. So I'll just push on Dinny and I suppose that's um, relevant for pensions as well like people are saving pensions and they're affected exactly the same way would that be correct yeah like everything is pensions are basically connected to traditional markets so uh, as we seen in 2008 like you know there could be horror stories with a pension and the problem with a pension horror story is you only learn the lesson when you're ready to retire all oh, my pension's gone you can't recover from that and I do in my consulting talk to people who've had private pensions and they've literally blown up in their faces. So I like to teach people a plan B pension where we use digital assets, crypto assets, which are totally unconnected from regular financial markets. Like Bitcoin is like a separate system, but it's a system where the money supply isn't expanded. The beauty of, and we'll probably talk more about Bitcoin, but it, it's that it's a, it's a fixed money supply that is only 21 million. Whereas in euros, it's like a massive Ponzi scheme that they print more every year. Every day they print euros and it devalues the euros I have versus my Bitcoin can never suffer that because nobody can print more Bitcoin. It's just this fixed supply. Um, so it's across the board like that inflation is a problem. It's a problem for your bank account, it's a problem for your pension. Your pension has to beat inflation. You know, if your pension is only bringing in 6% a year and inflation is running at 7 or 8% a year, well, your pension is basically doing nothing for you for the next X number of years. And the true inflation numbers the numbers that we're giving aren't reflective of the inflation. Look at a petrol pump. Get out your little calculator if you remember how to do percentages from school and figure out the percentage that petrol has risen in the last year. It ain't 6%. It ain't 3%. It's much higher than that. Go on to Google and Google how much an Irish home has gone up in the last year. It's somewhere between 20 and 30%. That is the inflation rate if you want to buy a home. So inflation is much higher than the numbers that were being given. It's a hurdle rate for any investments that you have they have to beat inflation just to stand still never mind making your money 
uh, and any savings that you have that you're not getting any interest in the bank remember banks are going to be going negative interest rates it looks like which means they're going to start taking your money for holding it there we used to get interest with combated inf inflation but that's gone now so money is just being eroded and, and wealth is being destroyed across the board with inflation and, and that's why it's it's cool that you're getting out there and, and teaching people how to protect themselves because as you say it's not being spoken about on the 6-1 news it's it's it, it, people aren't being educated and the problem is it's the poor and middle class who suffer from this um as as angry as we are and we're all seeing the prices going up I, I think we should be even more angry and i know it's it's a human condition to hold people responsible and accountable but if if some of the people knew exactly what was going on they'd be even you know more irate i i think anyway um but we'll, we'll move on um and so just what what is cryptocurrency dinny and then what is bitcoin as a part of cryptocurrency maybe if we could uh, deadly yeah Oh yeah, we talked about this. <laughs> no better man. Uh, so cryptocurrency basically came about from Bitcoin. It's blockchain technology. We won't bore you with the technicals. And I normally, as I teach people to understand this, I'm like, crypto is a lot of noise, basically. All right, there's so much happening in crypto. There's block, there's fucking NFTs, there's DeFi, there's gaming, there's metaverse. Okay, there's all sorts of stuff. And it's so distracting. So when someone comes into crypto and they try and figure it out, you have an open hell. I say to people, learn what Bitcoin is. This whole industry came from Bitcoin. It's the most important thing here. It's the only one that's lasted 13 years and it's always been at the very top. And it's the world's best chance at sound money. We have unsound money at the moment. Fiat currency goes down in value over time. Bitcoin is a money that goes up in value over time. We've only used fiat money, okay, which is money that's not backed by anything since the 70s. So it's not that long. It's only a 50 year experiment when our money has been on this fiat standard. Now, coincidentally, we chatted about health earlier. 1970 and before that, if you look at pictures from beaches, most humans are healthy. You look at what happened to the humans since the 70s, since we went on to this fiat money, it didn't just cause the money to debase, it caused the quality of everything to go down because the money is the underlying, it's the underlying base of human civilization. And when we move away from a money that can store value over time to a money that destroys value over time, we see it in our health, we see it in our, it, it, across the board, our education, everything we see it in. So what Bitcoin is, then, if we, if we try and stick with and, and get our heads around Bitcoin, which is what I say to people, unless you understand Bitcoin, there's no point in owning anything else, because you need to understand why Bitcoin's been so successful. Then you can look at any asset and understand, will it be successful? So a simple way to understand Bitcoin, I like to use, I have a gold coin in my hand, if this is on audio or not picture, but Bitcoin is digital gold, okay? It's a software version of a physical product. This is a physical product, this piece of gold, I'm holding it in my hand, okay? I'm banging it on the table. It exists in the physical world, okay? But Bitcoin shares all the characteristics of this physical product, okay? Bitcoin is divisible, gold is divisible. Bitcoin is fungible, gold is fungible. Bitcoin is portable, gold is portable. Bitcoin is recognizable, gold is recognizable. Bitcoin is scarce, gold is scarce. Okay, Bitcoin actually improves on the characteristics of gold. If I have a million euros worth in gold, I'll just give you one easy example. And I'm moving down to Melbourne. I can move my gold down to Melbourne. It'll take a couple of weeks. It'll cost me tens of thousands. There'll be a heap of paperwork. It'll take a lot of time and headache. Okay, now this is an interconnected world we live in. No one's got time for that. If I have a million euros worth of Bitcoin, I can move it down to a custodian in Melbourne, literally while I'm chatting to you here with a phone in the other hand. And it's done. Okay, and it's cost me about two quid. So in a world that's interconnected and we need to move value across space, Bitcoin is far superior than gold. And all the other characteristics Bitcoin is is, uh, is superior than gold. And how I explain that to people, why that why that's important is in my hand now I have a CD, another physical product. Okay, it exists in the physical world, but we don't use these anymore. They get what I call dematerialized. Okay, because we create a software version, and the software version is better than this physical product, this CD. We have Spotify now, and for the same price as buying one CD, okay, I can get access to any music in the world, pretty much you want to listen to, plus podcasts, photos, videos, whatever, okay, and I can get it on all my devices, in fact, I can get it on anyone's device, versus my CD, my physical product, which have all the constraints of a physical product, so Bitcoin is the same, because it's a dematerialized digital product, uh, 
its performance is 10 times better than the physical product, the actual gold coin that it's going to disrupt. And just like we've seen CDs being disrupted and become obsolete, we're on the journey to making gold, this physical product obsolete and using a digital software version um, instead. And the hurdle, sorry, I won't go on too long, but the hurdle for that is for most people, can something intangible, so it's something that you can't hold, hold can it have value? You know, is there value in Spotify even though you can't hold it? Of course there is, we know that, we accept that. But is there value in a, in a, in a money that you can't hold? or C and it's only got, it's only in digital representation. The way I explain it is I'm like, ask your kids, what do they ask for for Christmas? If any of you have kids, you might even ask for FIFA credits or, or skins of a computer game, but break it down. They see, they understand digital value and they could have had a physical bicycle or a football and they chose a digital product instead. So generations behind us already understand this. Generations who are older can struggle with it, but my thesis on it is it doesn't matter. There's a gold investor, his name's Peter Schiff. For the last 10 years, he's told people not to buy Bitcoin and he's missed out on the appreciation of 30 million percent. Anyone who listens to his investments with advice has lost out on 30 million percent, okay? And he holds, he's incentivized to not be pro Bitcoin because he owns gold mining companies and he has gold supply companies. So very much incentivized to be, uh, to not be pro Bitcoin. But he has a son who knows all the information that his father, Peter, knows. The son's name is Spencer. Spencer owns zero gold and only owns Bitcoin. Bitcoin is his gold. It's his digital gold. Now, inevitably, Peter's going to pass away. And all his gold bars, his son Mark, is going to inherit them. Now, his son doesn't see any value in the physical because his son is younger. And he sees more. he's like, why would I have the physical thing? I have to store that somewhere so I can just put it into cyberspace. It's much easier. It's much better. I can move it. So inevitably, that gold is going to become digital gold whether Peter gets his head around it or not. It's just as humans evolve, we move towards technology. So the first little step on understanding Bitcoin is that basically Bitcoin is digital gold. Okay. And if you can get your head around that, it's a good place to start. It's so much more than digital gold. And we get hung up on it being a currency and you need to go and be able to buy a coffee with it. But like, I can't buy a coffee with my gold coin. That doesn't mean it's not worth me holding it. I hope gold is, keeps you wealthy. Yeah. Okay, gold protects us from inflation. So it doesn't need to be a currency. I think a Bitcoin is more like an asset or a property. Now, it may, it's a currency in El Salvador, and as the world moves forward, maybe it evolves to being a currency in more places, but it doesn't need to be a currency for me to want to own it. It's a really scarce asset that's appreciating in value. That's why I own it. I don't own it to spend it and buy a coffee. I buy coffee with my euros because they're going down in value. I want to get rid of them. <laughs> yeah, I get you, I get you. And um, I can totally see where you're coming from with the, with the PlayStation games and the skins, because even in this house here, the lads are here and they're, they're, they want their, their skin, they're going to they're willing to pay money for it, et cetera, et cetera. And like what you were saying about technology becoming inflation or deflationary, like what you were explaining there, I, I follow Jeff Booth and in his videos, he explains the whole process of technology just becoming like your CD and Spotify. And it, it goes around and is shown in so many examples and it makes it so easily uh, understandable. It's just, yeah, it's actually and mind blowing how it, how it all like makes sense in the end. Like it's just, it's just a matter of getting the info and processing it in your brain kind of. And the reason why we haven't seen it happening or coming is because technology has been hiding the devaluation of our money. Okay. Technology has hidden it. All right. But it's just that the quality of everything has gone down. Because if, if I imagine what I do today with my smartphone in my hand, how I run my business, the amount of things that I can do, like I have the efficiency of probably having two staff 10 years ago. I'm literally doing the work of three, that three people could do 10 years ago. So that means I'm able to generate that wealth. But in real terms, it's, I'm not generating that wealth. I'm just staying still, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because technology is hidden. As the money goes down in value, technology is making everything easier for us and faster. But one way it has been reflected is, is in our health, if we look, because the quality of what we're able to do now has dropped. Uh, but technology does hide this um, money expansion. It's hidden it for years. And it's sort of, it, but now they're sort of colliding that we still have technology hiding it, but the actual inflation now is, is actually starting to beat technology. So we're ultimately getting net poorer or we're having to use more, you know, 
if your wages haven't increased with inflation, you're net poorer, if that makes sense. If inflation's gone up 10% and you didn't get a 10% pay rise, well, you're net poorer because you can't buy as much goods and services with your money anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, no, like you're explaining it, and, and Dr. Safadina Moose, he mentions that he's a big, big uh, Bitcoin guy. He, uh, he wrote the book, The Bitcoin Standard and the Fiat Standard after it. But in The Bitcoin Standard, he's saying exactly what you've just said there about like the health of people. And it's just this fiat health that's, you know, really contributing to how how bad we feel and how bad we're going down, how ill we are becoming and chronic disease and all that. And it all stems back to the fiat money system, exactly like you were saying, if you looked at a beach in the 70s compared to looking at a beach now and it's just so easy to put it all together when you when you start investigating it all and it just suddenly it starts making sense um so just briefly i suppose denny where, where did bitcoin come from like how did it when did it start or how did it manifest you know at the beginning good question um it's an interesting narrative we don't actually know who created bitcoin he, she, they go under the, the, the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, Satoshi came to uh, the, 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 the hacking community, the computer community in 2008 with an idea, a white paper for an electronic cash, a peer to peer, meaning no middleman needed. Everything we do online requires a middleman. I have to go through PayPal, AIB, um, eBay, Amazon, you know, there's always a middleman. Well, Bitcoin is peer to peer, so it's like cash in the digital world. We've never had an ability to do that before. And Satoshi's vision was to create this peer to peer money. And there's a couple of key things on Satoshi's invention. Like, I think it, it, it's possibly the greatest invention of humanity thus far, which is a massive statement. But I think that just comes from my understanding on it. Uh, if we can fix the money, as you say, we can fix the world. At the minute, half the adult population is unbanked and can't get basic financial services that you and me take for granted. But half the adult population in the world doesn't have that privilege. Bitcoin can literally fix that overnight. So it's bigger than me. It's bigger than just my wealth and making me rich and protecting me from inflation. It, it, can, create an, it can create a lot more prosperity and less hardship for the rest of the world. And it can do it quite easily. And a simple example, I know I'm on a tangent, sorry, but right, right, in, El Salvador, right. in El Salvador, the IMF were there giving their loans, predatory loans, putting them into debt for 40 years. And they banked 30% of the population in 40 years of work. And they're meant to be there to quote unquote, help them. Okay. When they released Bitcoin in four months, Bitcoin done, what the IMF and the regular system couldn't do in 40 years. In four months, Bitcoin banked another 30% of the population in the first four months. And that's the power of this thing because mobile phone saturation is worldwide. Internet saturation is pretty much worldwide. And your phone is a bank in your hands and you're now in the worldwide economy. But how did Bitcoin start? <laughs> it started in 2009 was when it kicked off. Satoshi had been working on it in 2008 in the community. And it was open source software. So the reason now that we've 30 crypto, 30,000 cryptos and so much noise, and most of it's just scams to take money off people who don't understand what it is. But the reason for that is because everything Satoshi done was open source software, which means he shared it with the world. Traditionally, when someone creates a company or a product, you don't want to tell anyone what you're doing. You want to keep it secret because it's all for you. You want to get rich. Okay. But Satoshi's invention was for the good of humanity. He didn't profiteer from it. All of the Bitcoins that he mined in the early days, he mined them exact same as they have to be mined now. He burned electricity. He could have just set the code that he got a pre-mine, like all like Ethereum, Vitalik got a pre-mine. He gets millions of Ethereum for free. And then we go and buy them. Or all the other cryptos where there's always a pre-mine where free coins are given to the creator and then they're like pushed them out to the market and then the plebs go buy them and they think it's going to be the next Bitcoin and they, then the thing crashes and they lose all their money. Bitcoin's very different. Satoshi didn't rig the game for himself. In fact, he didn't even reveal his identity because he wanted this thing to become basically a commodity, a decentralized commodity. And then Bitcoin achieved that by spreading throughout the world and networking throughout the world before anyone cared about it, before it had any value. And uh, it was almost like the only way that an apolitical, a, a money that's not tied to, to politics, a money that's not tied to a central bank, a money that is not governed by rulers. It, Bitcoin is a money that's governed okay by rules by maths by by physics by the same rules that keep 
an airplane in the sky, if you like. So humans can't change it, control it. No one can tweak Bitcoin so they get an advantage. The only way to get Bitcoin is either to purchase it or mine it. You know, so you have to earn Bitcoin, just like in the euros. I have to earn euros by exchanging my time for them. But some people are closer to the money printer and they'll get free loans and grants and bailouts and, and then someone else can print money. So the rules are very different depending on where you, you sit. And But in Bitcoin terms, the rules are exact same for everybody. <clears throat> Yeah, um, that's interesting. Like I've even heard some commentators and some pe people in the know, like um, offering the the concept that Bitcoin can actually, you know, save us from battles and wars. Like I don't want to get too political, but there's wars going on at the minute all over the world, and like it's it's it, people have made the point that Bitcoin can help this. Would that be your assumption as well, or? or can you explain where that comes from? Yeah, totally. Um, Bitcoin incentivizes peace because you can't take Bitcoin from someone forcefully. Okay, it's difficult to take Bitcoin forcefully. I can go and bomb somewhere. Well, I can't, but a country can decide yes. where someone's yeah. playing out to go and bomb somewhere, someone to take their physical land. We can see them bomb someone and take their physical commodities like oil. We can see them bomb somewhere destroy the place and take their gold but i can't bomb the feck out of somewhere and take their bitcoin because potentially i destroy the bitcoin or they have backups in place that it doesn't matter you can bomb the hell out of the place and you still don't get the bitcoin so by monetizing by putting a monetary value on this thing and as bitcoin becomes a money that's what's happening it's gone from zero to having almost a trillion of the world's monetary energy meaning money is inside of bitcoin now and it's continued to suck in and get bigger so by monetizing this asset that can't be seized or confiscated or taken by force, it only promotes peace. It promotes negotiation. It promotes, um, it doesn't, it, you're not rewarded for violence and blood. And we know like what's happening in, in, in Russia, you know, we're hearing what's happening in the media, but like it's about oil basically is what it's about. And it's always about money. It's about seizure of money and control. Uh, so as we go more onto a Bitcoin standard, war will be difficult. The next thing about the reason a central bank was created, if you look at the history of them, was to fund wars because a government, a country is only two ways to go to war. One is to print money to fund the war. And that's the easy way. The second way is to go to their citizens, right, we're going to go 80% tax because we've got to go do this war over here. We want to take this place for X, Y, Z. And the citizens were like, we're not interested in that. We don't want you to go to war there. We don't want to pay 80% tax. So there's no war. So the easy way is to print money to fund the war. And that's what governments have done over the centuries, since the Roman times. That's how the Romans lost their, their, their uh, dominance was because they, they basically debased their, their, their currency to go to war and it eventually destroyed them. Um, so, so Bitcoin does promote peace. It promotes cooperation and the rules are the same for everyone and it gives financial inclusion for everyone so it's very much like i say i'm passionate about bitcoin for and i love being working on this sound money for the world because it's bigger than me it's a mission much bigger than me and me just getting rich it's mm. like it's gonna make a better world and as well as that just my last little point on it bitcoin is a money that goes up in value over time euros are a money or sterling dollars whatever are money that goes down in value so with euros you're incentivized to spend 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 consume 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 go into debt 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 but if you compare that to a Bitcoin, with Bitcoin, you're incentivized to save. Think of your future. Do you really need that thing? Is that just a waste of your money? Because what you're spending it on, those Bitcoins will probably work more in the future. So do you really need the thing? Do you always have to replace, replace, replace? And I think that mindset not only creates more prosperity for people's future, but it helps the earth. Because like, we don't need to be constantly uh, consuming and crone out old to get new we can just we'll be more we'll be more sensitive to our purchases i think when we, we have a money that's going up in value over time we're incentivized to save it and think about our future as opposed to just consumption 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 yeah yeah i get you and just you're, you're really emphasizing bitcoin and i can we can see the difference in say the other coins they're a lot less um manageable because they're more manageable even because people can add or take away money from them at times like you were saying about the guy that owns Ethereum 
or invented it. Whereas Bitcoin is this kind of a set structure with 21 million kinds. It can't be changed. It can't be, you know, manipulated, stuff like that, which is a huge um, advantage to it as well. Um, and like, I know it's been around since 2009 and it's come up in value. Like, are we still, like, should people still invest? Is it too late now or is it is it just early in the cycle or midway through it or what kind of a time scale is it? It's the emergence of a sound money. So it's very early because only one to two percent of the world owns it. My thesis is 90 percent of the world owns it within the next one to two decades. So it's very early. Um, should you the, the problem with Bitcoin is people will see the price of it and they'll go, oh, it's 35,000 euros or 40,000 euros or whatever that is. So I can get a thousand of these jokes for under a penny. I'll get them. Uh, so they'll steer away from Bitcoin thinking that they're going to get better return on investment by buying something that's cheap. I teach people, don't worry about the price of something. It's about the value. The value is all that matters. Bitcoin might be expensive to you at 35,000. But that doesn't matter a bit to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the amount of the world's wealth that sits inside the asset and divide that by 21 million. At the minute, there's 1 trillion. If there's 10 trillion in Bitcoin, one Bitcoin is worth 750. What if there's 200 trillion? There's 900 trillion assets in the world, 900 trillion. Bitcoin is one. And it's a better store of value than the other 900. It's much better. And all we're seeing is the capital leaving. So for instance, capital is leaving currencies to go to Bitcoin. It's leaving stocks and equities to go to Bitcoin. It's leaving property investments. You know, and I literally have people ringing me up with my consultant going, Dini, I have an apartment there getting tax to be jays on it. They're ringing me up at 12 o'clock at night because the sink is leaking. I'm just selling it for Bitcoin. So we're in real time, I'm experiencing it from all the asset classes that capital is leaving and coming to Bitcoin. Um, same with bonds, like traditionally bonds and treasuries. That was just store of value. But now all the bonds are, infl they're not beating inflation. So you're guaranteed to lose money. You have 200 trillion in the bond market. And then you have one Bitcoin bond launched in El Salvador and it's going to be inflation. Yeah. You don't have to be a genius to work out that it's probably going to be a little bit of interest in that. And what if some of that 200 trillion starts to float in and we see more bonds built on Bitcoin? Uh, so like, and just not to be thrown out wild numbers, but there's a stock to flow model that's predicted the price of Bitcoin since Bitcoin was under a dollar. It's been, it's been accurate within two standard deviations of the model. That, that model has Bitcoin priced at seven figures in 2025 and eight figures in 2030. And what I say to people is even if, let's say plan B is stock to flow model is 90% wrong, 90% wrong, there's still probably nowhere you can get that sort of return on your money. And what if it's right? Bearing in fact for 13 years, it's been bang on. It's just no one's heard about it. Um, so, so Bitcoin for me certainly isn't overvalued. It's, and how I get my position is it is a dollar cost average. And just to touch on that for your listeners, dollar cost average just means buying a set amount at a set period of at the end of the month, some of my euros, I exchange them to Bitcoin. I don't need to look at the price. I don't need to time the market. I don't need to buy or sell. I'm just buying it because I think in the future, it's going to be much more valuable and there's going to be more than one trillion of the world's capital in it because money is just flooding into it. And all the macro events that are happening with the war and, and, um, and, um, what happened over the last two years, I won't mention the name, <laughs> but uh, you know what I'm talking about, um, you know, has just highlighted the reason why Bitcoin, this is why Bitcoin was created. Bitcoin was created for inflation as a life boat for an, inflate, in a, an inflation environment. And we have an inflation environment. Brilliant. Um, it's, it's, it's great advice and uh, well explained. I, I just, I'm conscious, I don't want to keep you too long, Dini. Um, I have written down here, is there anything we can do to combat inflation? And we've kind of answered that as in, you know, maybe invest in Bitcoin, get a bit of Bitcoin for the normal everyday person that's tipping around. And when you say dollar cost averaging, you just really mean you don't have to be taking 5,000 out of your bank account, planting it in or even 1,500, whatever it is. You just you just get your few, get your all your bits done and whatever money you've left aside, if, you're going, if you have it to save, put in that small amount. Is, is that kind of the way that you you, you uh, intend yeah how you protect how you protect yourself within in inflation or just and this has been the way long before the last two years this is how wealthy people get wealthy is you don't save money because money is going down in value over time you save assets because assets are going up in value why are the assets going up in value well it's just 
it's asset inflation because the money supply is expanding. So this is how wealthy people become wealthy is they understand this principle. And rather than saving euros in the bank, they'll change their euros into an investment property or they'll put them in stocks or they'll put them in precious metals or they'll put them into some sort of, a, you need to buy something that's scarce and desirable, okay? When I look at all the assets on the world today, the most attractive one is Bitcoin. It's, it's the most scarce thing on the planet because it's finite. We've nothing else on the planet that's finite, all right? Think of like the Mona Lisa. Your man who painted is dead and everyone likes it. What's the value of it? Infinity, it just goes up forever. You can't put a price on it. Bitcoin is pretty much similar like that. Okay, but Bitcoin can become a money. The Mona Lisa can't become a money because there's only one of them. It's only one, one person can own it, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but so that's basically how you protect yourself is to learn how to invest into assets. If you don't learn how to invest, you're guaranteed you're getting poor over time. And that's the problem. People are like, investing is risky. And I'm like, but not investing is riskier because you're guaranteed you're getting destroyed. Um, going down this money, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have a choice. So just learning the basics of how to invest and how to appreciate, how to accumulate assets. That's the goal. You want to have more assets. We're just taught how to save and get liabilities and, and debt. And um, I'm just going to, like pe people that might watch the video might swift through it, they might, they mightn't even watch it. But like if, if people were interested in, um, you know, investing in a bit of Bitcoin, is it simple enough to do on your phone or on a laptop or uh, it's, like I know you have crypto within you. We might just mention that at the end to see uh, plenty of videos and Facebook and loads of advice and direction, which is brilliant. I find, um, but just maybe in a quick, quick form, is it is it easy on a phone technology of today? Yeah, buying Bitcoin has, has never been easier. Um, it's just literally you go to what's called a crypto exchange. You, you could register with one. Um, it's basically like, think of it like a bank account. You'll have to have your, you know, everything you need to open a bank account, proof of yeah. address and ID and all the regular stuff. And um, once you've done that, you just click into the exchange, click on Bitcoin, buy, you get out your uh, debit card or whatever you want to use, or you can do a bank transfer to it. And an exchange basically does what it, sound, it sounds, it does, it exchanges euros for crypto like Bitcoin. And it does the vice versa. If you ever want to sell your Bitcoin or your crypto back for euros, you would do it on your exchange. Uh, and once you have your Bitcoin, then you have your Bitcoin wallet on the exchange. Uh, there's a lot more to it. Obviously, there's nuance and security issues and everything. Uh, but that's the basics of how you get it involved. I would say to people, invest into your education before you go dump your money into crypto, because most people, um, they end up down the wrong rabbit holes and it takes them a couple of years to figure it out. And they pay not only with their time, but with their money to learn the lessons. So for me, I've always got, like I said in the beginning, when I live in mobile home, I got great value by investing into my education. So that I understood, you know, Tony Robbins taught me, you can, you can spend 10 years trying to figure something out, make mistakes, waste your time, spend all the money, whatever. And then you're an expert after 10 years or just find someone who knows everything that you know and pay them. And in a weekend, you can literally learn everything you need to know and not waste 10 years. And then you have 10 years to profit from that knowledge. So that's something that I am very, uh, I always encourage people to, you know, focus on education first, especially with investing. It's education that makes money, not just having money. If you go and invest and you don't know what you're doing, you're going to give your money to someone who has a better education because the, the money in, in investments is just moved from the uneducated to the educated a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really important point. Like even myself, I, I wouldn't count myself even 50%, um, you know, great with, with, with Bitcoin or the knowledge on it. You're, you're just learning all the time. And the great thing for me is, um, it just the knowledge you gain it supplements everything you do especially in uh, in in bitcoin and everything to do with it um i just want to move on again denny um i just have written here what's eventually going to happen our, our fiat money system and it, i'm a pleb as you say and we don't have that i don't have that much knowledge but i have a feeling that it's it's getting to a point that of no return like it, it seems to be just going so far away like, is something going to happen fairly soon or, or could you make a judgment on that or is that difficult? Yeah, that's pretty difficult. Beyond my pay grade, I'd say, I don't know when it's going to happen or what's going to happen, but all we've seen is since the existence of fiat money, it's just gone down in value over time. When we look at the history of fiat currencies, they all eventually have gone to zero. The longest one surviving uh, at the moment is the British pound, but it's lost 99% of its value. And 
and that's the best one yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it doesn't look it's not great like uh, how the world plays out uh, over the next decade um is there a massive financial collapse i don't know none of that needs to happen for me as an investor i just protect myself from all eventualities uh, uh, and then i'm not like sitting on the sidelines just owning gold and hoping the world collapses around me and gold goes to 20 20 000 an ounce or something um so the, the 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 short answer for that is i don't know what they do they've innovated and they've made our fiat system survive till today i don't doubt that it's going to continue how long it continues i don't know maybe it continues beyond my lifetime either way the only certainty i know is that my purchasing power in euros is going to constantly go down and you the money supply is going to constantly inflate it has to because at the minute we've more debt than we have gdp so we have to print money just to service the debt so that countries around the world don't go bankrupt so the irony is people call bitcoin a ponzi scheme when they don't understand it but they if they understood their the system that they live and work yeah. in that is a, the definition of a ponzi scheme that you have to keep creating more and more and more money is created in that system through debt versus in bitcoin money is created in collateral it's collateral based money so like really what is debt it's, it's money created out of nowhere it's fresh air there's no collateral behind debt really yeah. like um so so that's just my sort of take and i don't know where fiat goes the only thing i know is it goes down in purchasing power and that's not going to change it's done that for the length of time that we've been on whatever it is euros pounds punts dollars their purchasing power goes down and that's not going to change yeah yeah that's that's cool um i know there's a lot we, we didn't cover but it's kind of just the first time and just a, a brief chat there's there's mining and there's loads of other stuff um basically is there any other people that you follow that people could gain information from or look up YouTube videos or, uh, you know, listen to or get knowledge on, on Bitcoin and, and, and inflation, etc.? Yeah, Michael Saylor speaks very eloquently, a lot more eloquent than I would speak on, uh, on Bitcoin. And he's a good resource to stick him in, Michael Saylor. He was the first public company to buy Bitcoin. Uh, he's a software engineer, so we understand software. Uh, and he's an engineer, so he understands engineering. Um, and he explains inflation and how Bitcoin works and everything really well. You mentioned the Bitcoin standard. That's a great book. It is heavy going. When I read the Bitcoin standard the first time, I did struggle through it. I've read it three times um, following in total. Now I had to revisit and each time I learn a little bit more. So yeah. sometimes I'd be like, should I really tell people to read the Bitcoin standard because it's heavy going or, or maybe just listen to a bit of stuff, but just basically getting into the Bitcoin community and uh, and learning and ultimately you start to see people who you connect with there's thousands of people in the space teaching and we all you know relate and connect with different types of people but uh sailor is a good place to start i like simon dixon as well really good uh, he was the first investment banker in the bitcoin space he wrote the first published book to feature bitcoin so simon has a really deep unique and early understanding of Bitcoin, not only Bitcoin, but our legacy financial system, because that's where he worked his career as well. So we understand both systems and you do get very unique perspectives from Simon. Yeah, um, I, I hadn't known about Simon and you mentioned him to me and I'm just uh, watching his videos now and I find them re really good, really helpful. And he, he's, he's got a lot of value. Um, just finally, Dini, where, where can people find you? Um, like social media or, or where do people catch up with you well if there's a few waves you'll find me out in the sea surfing <laughs> um crypto with dinny uh we're on facebook crypto with dinny we're on instagram crypto with dinny uh we're on twitter twitter at dinny collins uh, and obviously the website crypto with dinny.com uh, we do we have five free tips when you hit the website if you, if you're new get on them they're just basic mistakes don't make rookie errors i find a lot of people do even if you're in crypto for a couple of years they don't realize that they might have made rookie errors at the start uh, we also do a free bitcoin basics uh webinar and uh, you can get a ticket for that on the website crypto with Dini, uh, dot com. jump on that and it's just a, a webinar like this and i just go through sort of with a bit more structure to explain bitcoin a little bit deeper and um uh, and that's why and i obviously have full disclosure i have paid products as well you can pay me and i can set up a retirement plan in crypto for you and and all the other stuff but uh yeah all the, all the regular socials youtube as well 
and uh, we do I do a podcast as well which is going well on YouTube and it's also on Spotify Jeez, I'm everywhere <laughs> that's, that's the beauty of today's world you, you, it is easy to get out there and um, yeah I've seen and heard and um, if you have the guts to do it uh, you'll reap the rewards isn't that it yeah yeah so um no that's that's great and uh, just want to say thanks Denny thanks for your time and thanks for coming on to have this little chat with me definitely man yeah thanks very much for inviting me on it was it was cool to chat about that so Thanks very much, Jenny. We'll talk again soon. Boom. Thanks.